All right, everybody. It is uh, Monday, April 1st. Happy April Fool's Day. Hope you can hear me okay. I have been in, uh, here in my room about five minutes. I just got back from the courthouse. It was an eventful day uh, at the courthouse, day one of jury selection, and it's one that I won't forget. Let me know if you can uh, hear me okay. I uh, you know, had to get everything set up here today, and I want to let you know what happened today in the courtroom. It was a little surreal, I'll be honest with you, walking into the courtroom, courthouse, going up to the fourth floor where Lori Vallow had her trial just one year ago. It felt like I was there last week. <laughs> like It felt like I didn't leave. All the bailiffs were the same, saying hi to each other. Uh, of course, there's been changes with the defense team and the prosecutor's team as far as the attorneys that are on the... Uh, representing it. And of course, it's a whole different case. But boy, it was it was um, surreal. It's surprising to me how normal it felt. A um, lot of changes that I want to go over this trial compared to last trial. And uh, I want to tell you exactly what happened and where we stand tonight, because we have got to get the magic number is 50. So what they're doing, what Judge Boyce is doing this this week, by the way, thanks for joining us. This is Courtroom Insider. I'm Nate Eaton. Court got out around 6 o'clock, got to my car, rushed back here to the hotel, didn't even have time to put a graphic on the TV behind me. So we're just going with it. Let me know where you're watching from and if you have any questions, and we will get to those tonight. We have a great guest coming up, John Thomas. He was Lori Vallow's attorney, one of her attorneys. He's going to be with me to talk about the death penalty, which, of course, is a big topic, was a big topic today during jury selection, and will continue to be a big topic until... Uh, the end of the trial, because Chad Daybell is frankly looking at the death penalty or life in prison. And um, that's what uh, that's what we're looking at today. So here is what we are going to um, talk about tonight, I believe, if I can pull this up. OK, there we go. For some reason, my computer uh, froze up, but I hope hopefully you can hear me Let, or see me, actually. OK, if you can see this graphic, it is day one of jury selection. And um, this is uh, one of probably at least five days of jury selection, I would believe, and uh, maybe maybe longer. And um, tonight, we're going to talk about what happened today in the courtroom. Are we close to having a jury? One-on-one -on -one with John Thomas. We're going to remember Tylee, JJ, and Tammy, and we are going to answer your questions. So this is where we stand tonight. Um, what happened today is that two groups of 16 jurors were brought in. I should say potential jurors. They were brought in today, all 16 at a time. And by the way, we were streaming this on EastIdahoNews.com, our YouTube channel. You can go check that out. It was also on my Facebook page, East Idaho News Facebook, if you want to go back and watch it. It gets kind of tedious, but it was fascinating to be in the courtroom today compared to last year with Lori Vallows. We were in an overflow room watching a little video feed. The video feed that you all were probably watching, that's what we were watching last year. There is a different feel inside that courtroom. So the first group of 16 was brought in. And what the judge does is he goes through their based on the questionnaires that they've answered, and he will say, okay, juror um, number, well, well, actually, do any of you have a problem knowing that um, this case could take 10 weeks? And somebody might raise their hand and say, yeah, I don't get paid for my job if I take 10 weeks off. And the judge could say, okay, and then the prosecution can ask questions, the defense can ask questions, and one of the sides or the judge can move to strike the juror, release them, or they can keep them on and see where it goes. After the group of 16 in the morning was brought in, they, they, a few of them were dismissed for re different reasons, like a mom who is the caretaker for her two-year-old and the dad works full-time and the two-year-old needs the mom to help go to sleep things like that or travel plans or can't get out of work training whatever it may be health issues they then just let all the jurors go in the back and they pull them out one at a time and they question them and they get a little bit more invasive in the questioning such as what are your views on the death penalty or you said this in your questionnaire what did you mean by that things like things of that nature and then, the, again, the defense or the prosecutors can say, okay, we want to strike them, we want to get them out of here, or we want to keep them. Out of all of those that are kept, the magic number that we have to get to is 50. So 50 people have to survive the selection. 
Once there is 50, then the defense and the prosecutors will go through and whittle it down to 18. 12 jurors and 6 alternates. So build it up to 50, then narrow it down, and those are preemptory strikes where the, the defense or prosecutors don't have to have any reason to strike them. They can just say, goodbye. Uh, you know, nothing personal, goodbye. So we need 50. Today we had two groups of 16. The morning group went until about 2 o'clock. It was late. Rush out to the car, have lunch, go back in. The evening group, the afternoon group, went until 6 o'clock. Afternoon went a lot quicker. They were kind of more in a hurry, I think, and the judge is like, we got to get out of here. So we need 50. Here's where we're at. 16 have advanced. We have 16 out of 50. Eight men and eight women. Interesting there. Um, I have notes on each of them. I'm not going to go back and, you know, read you the thorough notes, but there it is an, it is a collection of older men, younger men, older women, younger women, uh, different jobs, different occupations, d different family situations, um, different views on the death penalty. That was a big thing here. Some one man, one elderly man was, was dismissed this afternoon because he is adamantly, adamantly, adamantly opposed to the death penalty. And he said in every single case, I am against the death penalty. He was strong in his Catholic faith, and he is totally against it. Other people totally support the death penalty. And if they support the death penalty, the judge then has to ask, well, do you believe the death penalty should be administered in every murder case or just some? And and I don't think I heard one person say every murder case. Most just said some. So we have 16. We have eight men, eight women. That means that come tomorrow, another group will meet at 9 o'clock in the morning, another group of 16, and they will try to get more out of that group. And I believe it's just going to be one group tomorrow. If I understood the judge correctly at the end of the day, I think they're going to do the one group, and then they have to go through more questionnaires for a potential follow-up group. So tomorrow might be a shorter court day. Uh, don't take me 100% at that, but know that tomorrow could be shorter and that um, we could get more people uh, there on that jury. So... Some gen gen uh, general observations that I had today. Far less people in court. Now, it is jury selection, and generally there's not as much interest. But last year on Lori Vallow's jury selection day, uh, we were all in an overflow room, and there were probably 50 people, maybe 40. Today, we had maybe 20, and at the end of the day, there were four of us. <laughs> Me and three members of the public. Far less media here. The Boise media is here. I'm here. A uh, couple of stations from Salt Lake City are here, and that's about it. So I, I think that a court TV showed up tonight as I was leaving. They were doing going live outside of the courthouse, but the media interest is far less. Now, you could argue that there's – because you guys are watching it on YouTube on East Idaho News. I'd love to know your thoughts. What, do you think there's less interest, or is it just that it's more accessible to you? Um, as I said, jury selection could be pretty boring. I don't know of a lot of people that would sit through that whole thing. Uh, Tom Evans, who I showed you his interview last night, he was there today. And another former juror showed up, a mother. I mistakenly referred to her as Tom's wife on my Twitter, and I was wrong. It wasn't his wife. I didn't see her. But um, she, she said it was a little surreal to be back in that courtroom. So those are some of the observations. Uh, some of the other observations is the prosecution's different. Last year, it was Rachel Smith, Lindsey Blake, Rob Woods, Spencer Rammel, and Tanya Rawlings. Tanya Rawlings is now a judge. She's gone. Spencer Rammel isn't there. Rob Wood and Lindsey Blake are, but they've brought on Ingrid Batty from the Attorney General's office, and they've brought on uh, Rocky Wixom, who is Lindsey's deputy in Fremont County. So there's a different change of attorneys. And of course, there's the change in John Pryor. How was Chad acting today? Chad was acting like how, like how he has at every other uh, hearing. He was focused. He was dressed up in a blue shirt, tie, a khaki greenish pants. He, um, not disruptive, just, you know, Chad being Chad. I mean, there was times John Pryor kept forgetting to turn on his microphone. At one point, Chad leaned over and turned it on for him. John Pryor had to thank him. I know many of you were talking about, why is the sound issue so bad? Why are the camera issues so bad? Can you zoom in? Can you pull out? That is all on the cord. That's not on us. I wish it was, but it's not. So that is, um, that is where it stands now. I did want to pull up quickly because I 
um, thought it was interesting, at least in my opinion, of to see where we were at a year ago today on Lori Vallow's trial as far as the um, number of jurors we had on day one. So how about this? How about I, I during, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play you John um, Thomas's interview and, and I'll get you that number as far as if we're further ahead with this case versus Lori's or not. Uh, but John Thomas has been a defense attorney for quite some time in Idaho Falls. He's represented a lot of serious crimes. Of course, he was brought onto Lori Vallow's case last year, and he agreed to sit down and talk with me about the death penalty case. Couldn't talk specifics about Vallow, but we did touch on it a little bit. I know a lot of you have burning questions for him. It's still in the appeals process, and because he was not the main attorney on it, he's he, he just wanted to be careful that he couldn't talk about, that he didn't talk out of turn about the case. But um, he did talk about it with me, some of the aspects. So I'm going to go ahead and roll that interview right now. And uh, we'll come back, we'll talk about it, and we'll take your questions. I'm Nate Eaton, and today I'm talking with John Thomas. For those of you familiar with the Lori Vallow case, you likely heard his voice every day, or if you were in the courtroom, you saw him. We're not going to talk about that today, uh, but we are going to talk about an aspect of the Chad Daybell case and that is the death penalty. And not, not just his case, obviously, there's some other cases that are happening in Idaho, and it's been in the news a lot lately, so I asked John if he could come in and kind of explain exactly how this whole death penalty issue works. So uh, thank you, John, for coming in. Sure. Let's just get started with, how does an attorney like yourself become qualified in a death penalty case? So um, there's two uh, versions of a death penalty qualified attorney. The first version is uh, your first chair. The second version is your second chair. And so uh, in order to become first chair, you have to sit on a death penalty case as a second chair attorney, and then you move up. And so in order to become death penalty qualified as a second chair uh, attorney, um, you uh, fill out an application. It's about 20, 25 pages long. Um, you have to have done so many uh, cases to trial, felony cases to trial. Um, you're vetted by a group of attorneys um, and they decide whether or not you have the specialized skills. You have to demonstrate that you have um, skills in dealing with expert witnesses, that you have skills in dealing with um, uh, uh, not only expert witnesses, but high complex litigation, lots of motions, those kinds of things. You have to submit uh, writing samples and those kinds of things. And then they decide whether or not they're willing to allow you to be uh, death counsel. And then if they are, you get assigned a, uh, a mentor. Uh, in my case, it was Jim Archibald. And um, he agreed to mentor me as a death penalty uh, attorney. And um, yeah, I've been with him. We've done probably five or six death cases together none of them have gone all the way to trial and uh, we were thinking that Lori Vallow may end up going to trial uh, as a death case but a couple of weeks before the trial we ended up uh, getting death penalty qu taken off the table. Mm -hmm. Which Jim has said is really the win for yeah. you guys as the defense oh, yeah. team. That's, yeah, that's it. That's what we do. That's what we work for is to get the death penalty off the table and if we can't get the death penalty off the table a win at a death trial would be uh, to either get her life without parole or to get uh, the defendant, um, you know, obviously an acquittal, but a lot of times, even short of an acquittal, uh, a, a win is still uh, not having the death penalty imposed. Sure. So you were second chair in that case. Yes. And had it gone all the way as a death penalty case, you would then have been qualified to be a first chair. Yeah, theoretically, right. yeah. I would, have, I would have qualified to be a first chair, but then you have to fill out another application get vetted and um, yeah, that, that's the only hurdle that I'm, uh, that I have not met yet is I haven't been through a death penalty uh, jury trial. And meaning for the person watching, well, what's the difference between a first and a second chair? Um, not much really. I mean, the first chair deals with, um, you're kind of in charge of all the experts, of all the witnesses, of all the mental health uh, stuff. And the second chair um, is your co-counsel, but um, you, you, there's a lot of collaboration and, and you're always collaborating with co-counsel. You're meeting with all the experts at the same time. Um, ultimately, the first chair has the final say. And so if there's a disagreement about how you want to proceed uh, and the second chair says, well, gee, I think that we should probably go this way. And the first chair says, 
well, thanks, but um, I think we're going to go in another direction. And the second chair always says, yeah, okay, you're, you're more qualified. You're, you're uh, you know, most of the time the first chair uh, guy is a lot more seasoned mm -hmm. and, and has had more trials and understands uh, the background better. So what kind of cases in Idaho could be qualified, the defendant, where the prosecutor could say, we're going to go after the death penalty? So there has to be a murder, and it has to be, there has to be a homicide. Somebody has to die, um, and it has to be, uh, there, there are certain qualifiers that, uh, that make it a death penalty case. Um, there could be a mass shooting where more people, more than one person dies. Uh, there could be... Uh, something that is uh, specifically atrocious and cruel, like the way that they kill the person. Uh, if this person is has a high likelihood of uh, or a high propensity to kill again, um, that's one. Uh, if there is a uh, death involving a police officer in Idaho, you get the death penalty. Oh, wow. um, yeah, they automatically go for the death penalty on if you if you end up killing a police officer. Um, uh, let's see what else. If there's uh, specific um, ones for, y there has to be a, qu uh, a qualifying. Uh, if you're committing a murder in that's involved in a rape, a robbery, a burglary, something to that effect, um, then you're qualified to be a, a death candidate. Uh, so there, there are a few uh, specific ramifications uh, to doing certain crimes that will push you into that death uh, sentence. Also, if you kill someone while you're an inmate in prison, um, you're automatically qualified for death. Oh, interesting. Okay, so and the prosecutor has to declare within like 60 days of, be, of a charge, right? Correct. Or arraignment. Once, or... once they're arraigned on that charge, um, uh, the person will plead guilty or not guilty. Generally in a death case, if it's a murder one case, they'll plead not guilty. And then the state has 60 days from the date of that arraignment to say, yes, we're going to seek the death penalty. No, we're not going to seek the death penalty. Right now, I'm still awaiting uh, two cases uh, where death penalty qualified counsel has been uh, appointed, but we're not sure if they're going to seek the death penalty yet. Mm. So what, what are the differences in a trial for same crime? I mean, I guess we could compare the Chad and Lori trials if we want. Sure. Are we going to see differences in how things are, are argued or witnesses or evidence versus a death versus non-death? Sure. Um, death is different. And, and there's a Supreme Court of the United States cases that say that. Death penalty is just different. It's, you get a lot more uh, leeway in your, uh, in your defense. Um, you can uh, ask a lot more questions. You can put on a lot more witnesses. Um, everything is on the table uh, on a death penalty case. Everything is mitigation. Um, uh, in a death penalty case, and, and in the Lori Daybell case, we specifically had to have a mitigation expert, somebody at the outset when we first started the case um, who could go through Lori's background, go through Lori's, uh, her life, basically, turn it upside down and shake it out and find out everything about Lori. Uh, and uh, in the Daybell case, he'll have to do the same thing. He'll have to have a mitigation expert who's done all that before now because uh, in a death penalty case, there's two tracks. There's the, uh, there's the uh, pre-conviction uh, uh, track, which is called the guilt phase, and then there's the post-conviction track, which is the uh, sentencing phase or the punishment phase. And you have to be prepared for both phases at the, outside, at the outset of the, uh, of the case. So you can't go into a trial and say, well, we're going to win this case, so we don't really need any mitigation evidence. We don't need to re be ready for sentencing. The Supreme Court of the United States has said um, you have to be ready for both phases of the, uh, of the case at the outset. Mm -hmm. So you have to be ready for uh, the mitigation phase. You have to be ready for the punishment phase while you're preparing for the guilt phase. Interesting. So could there be some witnesses that you hold for that guilt phase that you don't have in the, or for the penalty phase versus the guilt phase? Right, absolutely, yeah. You'll have um, a, a majority of the witnesses that you'll have on your witness list will be for the penalty phase because those are you know, not fact witnesses. Those are witnesses who are gonna be able to tell the story of the person uh, who is getting, uh, who, who was convicted of, 
of first degree murder and they're looking for the death penalty. So that whole purpose of that second part, it, once a guilty verdict comes down, if a guilty verdict comes down, preserve their life. Right, that's it. And that's what the defense is fighting and then the prosecution's fighting, put them to death. Right. And so you have to go in with, with both phases in mind. You have to go in and say, look, we're gonna try to uh, uh, prove that our client is innocent, but if we can't prove that, we still have this backup plan and we're pushing forward and we are uh, prepared for both of these phases at the same time. And one of the differences too, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the judge won't hand down the sentence. Correct, it is the jury. The jury is the only one, and it'll be the same jury uh, that is in the, uh, the, the guilt phase. So you'll, you'll go through the whole trial like a regular trial and uh, the jury will hear all the evidence. And then once the jury says guilty or not guilty, if they say guilty, then immediately, not necessarily immediately. So if it happens on a Thursday, they might start the new trial on Monday, mm -hmm. but it will be within, within days and it'll be the same jury uh, who hears the, uh, the, the punishment uh, phase of it. And so once they found this person guilty or not guilty, if they find them guilty, then they move right into the punishment phase and the jury will now hear a brand new trial. You'll have a new opening statement. You'll have a new um, uh, um, witnesses testifying. The prosecution will put on uh, aggravating witnesses who will say, you know, this person needs to be put to death because of X, Y, and Z. And the defense attorney will put on witnesses who say, no, this person's life is worth, has some value. Uh, their life is worth saving and we need to save that person's life. Um, and when the jury goes back to deliberate, they deliberate, they deliberate on, the, on the guilt phase, whether or not they're guilty or not. And then they have to deliberate once again on a whole nother. They go back into the same room and they all argue over whether this person is um, worthy of death or not worthy of death. And it only takes one person to say, nope, I'm not gonna put this person to death. And if they do that, then the whole deliberation is over. Really? Yeah, and then they can't put them to death. You have to be, it has to be unanimous uh, vote that this person is worthy of death. Wow, so how long could that penalty phase take? I mean, could that be another week or two? Or? Could be, yeah, it could be weeks. Yeah. Wow. Because the, the defense uh, is going to put on lots of witnesses about this person's life. They may put on a third grade teacher who says, oh, you know, Johnny was, he, he was such a sweet boy, but you know, he came to school sometimes and he didn't have lunch or he came to school and he was, uh, you could tell that he had been beaten down by his family, by his parents or, or, or siblings or whatever, or, or, you know, different things that happened in his life, which would relate, which would relate to somebody saying, well, gee, he didn't get a, a full fair shake uh, at life, you know. They may put on uh, a high school teacher who said, wow, I, re I remember this guy and he was so nice to these other kids. There was a new kid that came in and he was the first one to go to this kid mm. and shake his hand and say, hey, you know, he, he, he really welcomed this person in. And so that gives him a redeeming value. You know, you could put on um, somebody who uh, worked in a, a job with them and said, hey, um, he was a hard person to deal with, but at the end of the day, he really taught me some serious lessons in my life, and he really showed me uh, my work ethic and how, how well this went. So mitigation can be anything. Hmm. It can be anything from you know, a, a third grade teacher to a, a military uh, officer who says, I know this person and, and I know that he's worthy of, of living in life. There's some redeeming value. Right. So then the jury, once that portion's finalized, I guess there's gonna be a closing argument too from both sides? Yeah, there'll be a closing argument. They deliberate, they come back right away or however long to deliberate and they say, this is the sentence. Yeah. And then the judge, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, there's only two sentences, either death or life in prison without oh. parole. So they can't like, do like 20 years? No. It's gotta be one or the other. Yep, yep. Wow, so then we hear a lot about once somebody's been sentenced to death, it taking years and years and years and years for the execution to actually happen. Yeah. In Idaho, at least. Everywhere. Why, why is that? Because you get certain appeals and there are certain mandatory appeals that they have to do um, and certain safeguards. I mean, it, it takes a lot to kill a person. And if, if the state and if the government is going to take someone's life 
we want to make sure absolutely that this person actually did it. You know, I come back to the Chris Tapp case and I always come back to the Chris Tapp case because it was so jarring for me to read the sentencing memoranda and hear um, the, the prosecutor asking for the death penalty. He asked for the death penalty and the judge, uh, ultimately back then, the judge had the decision to whether, yes, I'm gonna give you the death penalty or no, I'm not gonna give you the death penalty. It wasn't up to the jury at that time. Mm -hmm. It's changed since then. Um, and the judge luckily said, no, I, I think there's some redeeming value to you. I think there's some, some, something in you that, uh, that is worth saving. And I'm glad he did because 20 years and 58 days later, um, we have a guy who was taken out of prison and was released. And now we find the guy who actually did the murder. And so um, there, there are a lot of safeguards in there for that specific purpose. We don't want to kill somebody unless they really, really deserve it. The death penalty is reserved for the worst of the worst. Did that case change your views on the death penalty? Chris Tapp? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I was always, you know, I used to be of the ilk of, you know what, um, if somebody's really that hardened and that uh, bad, then yeah, they should probably get the death penalty. And now I'm, how do we even know? You know, that's where I'm at. How do we even know if this person actually did it? Because the evidence, the way the evidence comes out, um, there's sometimes there's things that aren't that the jury just isn't allowed to hear, and uh, due to different you know rules and uh, and statutes where people just aren't allowed to testify or the state doesn't put specific things on and the defense says well we don't want to put that evidence on because it may somehow uh, be misinterpreted you don't ever get the full story and so while the system isn't perfect. Uh, I certainly don't think that anybody uh, is eligible for death in this in this day and age. Well, there's too much um, there's too much at stake. Somebody's life is always worth worth uh, worth saving, and I think that I don't have the uh, I don't have the 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 ability to tell someone yes. I don't think your life is worth saving. I just don't. You kind of made that point during Lori Vallow's sentencing. Right. And you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. You got hammered a little bit. Oh, from, I'm sure I did. Uh, online and whatnot. But yeah. that, was, that was the point, at least to me, that you seem to be making. Yeah. You know, I mean, who, who are we to judge, right? I mean, we all have to uh, end up at the same place in front of the pearly gates, and we're all going to be looking for mercy. And so I don't want to be the one uh, who is, is saying, yeah, this person should have been put to death. I just don't think that's ever appropriate for a human being to say that this person should be put to death. And in Idaho, there's uh, the lethal injection or firing squad. Firing squad now. They haven't uh, quite built the facility yet, so I think they're still working on that. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're going towards firing squad, which I don't know if it's less humane uh, because you have to have humans pulling the triggers on these guns. And I'm... I'm just not sure that, that we are prepared to say, yes, put me behind that gun. I want to kill someone. Um, it's different when you go hunting and you kill an animal, but when you kill a human being, even if it's in the most humane type of a way where you're in a firing squad and this person has been proven beyond any reasonable doubt that they are uh, uh, the worst of the worst and should be killed off, I'm just not sure as a human being that we're prepared to um, take that on for the rest of our lives. Anything you want to add about the death penalty that we didn't get to? Um, if you're ever on a death penalty case, think about it. I mean, really pour your heart into it and say, is this really the, the right decision for this particular person? Because you're not just affecting uh, the victim's family who have lost somebody. You're affecting other families and you're affecting possibly your own psyche where it comes out years later, sometimes 20 years later, that, hey, this guy was really telling the truth. He really didn't do this particular crime. And we found out that it was actually done by somebody else. I wouldn't want to be in that position and have that on my conscience that, man, I voted to kill somebody when... Um, he actually didn't do it. And it seems like there's stories every month, every week of yeah. those things where yeah. someone's on death row and then DNA clears them or something right. happens. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, John. I, I appreciate your insight and 
Uh, thank you for explaining a kind of a complicated thing. As you said, we don't really have a lot of these cases that actually go to trial right. and go through all the way. So yeah. this might be the first and the last for a while. And a big thanks again to John Thomas for chatting with me. Um, you know, he uh, mentioned the Chris Tapp case. For those of you not familiar with that case, it is one that has really been in the news in Idaho lately. This is a man who served 20 years for a crime he did not commit. He was found guilty of um, killing a girl, an 18-year-old woman, raping her, killing her. Uh, he actually confessed to the crime, but it turned out to be false confession. The police kind of coerced it out of him. And he he went to prison, and for 20 years, the Angie Dodge, the victim, her mother, Carol, fought to get Chris out. And John Thomas was his attorney. And he ended up getting him out in 2017, but the, the charge was still on his record. But then they found the real killer named Brian Drips. Drips and Tap, go figure. Um, Brian Drips was arrested. He was found guilty in 2019. And um, he is serving time in prison. And then Chris was exonerated. Well, Chris went on to get $11.7 million from the city of Idaho Falls. And he was living his life. He's been out since 2017. And in November, he's in Vegas and he's killed. And he was at a party. And uh, you can read all the stories on EastIdahoNews.com. He's dead and a man has been charged with his murder. So it's just a crazy story. Anyway, John Thomas has been on that case from the beginning. It wasn't a death penalty case, but he was making the point that if Chris Tapp had been sentenced to murder, he could have been executed during that 20-year period. And so he's obviously against the death penalty. What are your thoughts on the death penalty? I mean, imagine if you were the 32 people that were brought in today and you have to tell the judge, do you support the death penalty? Could you put someone to death? I said this the other night that I don't know if the guilty, not guilty verdict will be as much as a surprise as whether Chad Daybell will get death or life in prison if he's found guilty. That's that's the thing to uh, think about. So again, thank you, John Thomas, for uh, chatting with me, explaining that. I tried. It was it's very hard to get death penalty attorneys to talk about this sort of stuff, but you know it's important for all of us to understand. Hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, I do want to get to your questions. I do need to make a correction. Yesterday I said that John Pryor owned Chad Daybell's house. He does not own it 100%. There are other people who have apparently signed on to the uh, the mortgage or the ownership of the home. So John Pryor is not the full owner of that home, and I, I apologize for getting that wrong. Um, I, I had seen his name on some documents, but um, I was informed this afternoon that that is not the case. And if I make a mistake, I need to correct it. I did make a couple – I made two mistakes today that I know of, a lot more than that. Um, one is that I said that Tom Jones, the juror – Tom Evans, his – wife was with him it was another juror and then i also said that there were 18 potential jurors brought in but there were 16 anyway it was a long day um okay so let me show you again let me remind you someone just said so what exactly are these charges there they are can you see them on your screen chad daybell is facing these charges he of course is charged with uh, the murder of tylee ryan jj vallow tammy daybell He's charged with conspiracy to commit the murders of Tylee, JJ, and uh, uh, Tylee. And they said today that to these jurors, like, you do understand that there will likely be evidence or you will be shown evidence that connects that there were co-conspirators such as Alex Cox, Lori Vallow, uh, you know, those those people. And, and they, they did explain that to the jurors and let them know that there are other co-conspirators in this case. What, basically what that means is they all conspired to do these crimes, according to the prosecutors. Um, he also faces a charge of grand theft, and he also chases the, or faces the charge of insurance fraud. So it was interesting. One of the um, uh, jurors today, potential jurors today, was, uh, I believe he was a, an accountant, or he did something with finance, and they asked if that would prohibit him or insurance or something from being unbiased, and he said, "No, it won't. It'll it'll be fine." So, um, anyway, those are the charges. I know that some of you were asking about that. Now, um, every day, of course, we like to remember and honor the victims, the the people who were uh, sadly who are no sadly no longer with us. If you know 
or new Tammy, JJ, or Tylee and want to share a story or a recollection about them here on Courtroom Insider, my direct messages are open. You can message me on Facebook or email me or on Instagram. You can tweet me um, and share that story. You can remain anonymous or not. This is probably my favorite picture of JJ and Tylee. And one of you sent me a beautiful um, image of this that that uh, is in my office uh, in Idaho Falls. And it was like a some sort of craft. I don't even know what you call it. I'm, I'm not real crafty, but you took pieces and made it look really beautiful. <laughs> I know that does not describe anything. You're probably like, what, what is he talking about? I'll have to show you. Maybe I'll ask one of my colleagues to take a picture tomorrow and send it. But uh, this is the beautiful picture. We know that Tylee loved JJ. Uh, there was, there's videos of her treating JJ like uh, he's her son and just kind of watched over him and cared for him. And uh, JJ, you know, loved his big sister. And so tonight we remember JJ and Tylee as well as Tammy and Charles Vallow. They, of course, were um, other people that were affected by this. And um, I just wanted to honor them tonight. So we have a fun week of guests coming up. Of course, we had Tom Evans. If you missed our juror last night, go check it out because he is um, he uh, had a lot of interesting things to say. You can check that out on our YouTube channel. Again, if you haven't watched it, I want to show you who's coming up tomorrow. You can't miss tomorrow because look who it is. The king of true crime himself, Keith Morrison. Keith's been on the case since the beginning, along with me, Shane Bishop, the producer from Dateline. Um, and they have produced, oh man, I think 10 hours of Datelines on this story. In fact, Dateline was brought up a lot today during the jury selection. Uh, but Keith will be here and he's going to answer questions about this. And I asked him what he is looking for specifically in this case compared to Lori's. So he's going to talk about that. Nancy Grace will be here Wednesday uh, as you can imagine, that interview is probably a little more fiery than Keith's, but she's going to share her thoughts and you can tell me if you disagree or agree with them or what your thoughts are. And then on Thursday, Vinny Politan, if you haven't watched Closing Arguments on Court TV, he really breaks down the cases and is a really compelling um, interview. And he will also talk about what he's looking for in this case. He's He has followed it from the beginning and has really been interested on it. So that is what... Um, that's what you can look at for the next coming days. It's going to be a really fun week full of um, news and lots of information. So a reminder, here is where you can follow us over uh, the coming days throughout the whole trial. Uh, we have live streaming from the courthouse starting at 830. I do want to let you know, though, that this week, jury selection, it's actually starting at 9. They moved it back to 9. So we won't start the live stream tomorrow until 8.45 Mountain Daylight Time. So join us at 9, but then once the trial gets started, it will be at 8.30. We will have live written updates all day. I've got those on eastidahonews.com. If you want to go check those out, you can. Um, uh, I was, you know, it's, they're also on my X feed. And then we have the Nightly Courtroom Insider. Thank you for being here. I couldn't do this without you. And then if you want to see past videos, past uh, stories, whatever, you can do that. And then here is, of course, if you would like to keep up to date, sorry, I know I'm, I'm here, it's full of uh, promotions, but uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Instagram is more personal type family stuff, but I am on there. And then our East Idaho News YouTube channel, you can find all of your stuff on there um, if you are interested in finding out about those things. Okay, let's get to your questions. I've been talking long enough and I'm hungry. Where should I go for dinner? What should I have for dinner? Um, I'm, I'm ready to try something new in Boise. First of all, the shout outs. Thank you so much to these people for watching. Jolene Steed, Amy Smith. Amy's a faithful. She's watching every night. Hi, Amy. Thank you. Terry Gibson, Teresa Moore, Robin Bach. Thank you. Nicholas Walker. We have somebody from London, Sheila Wynn, Caitlin Ritchie, Tammy Darling. What a darling. And Linda Bradford. So glad you guys are watching. Thank you so much for watching. Now to your questions. First one we have. I have not read these. Thanks to Peggy. She's sending these to me. Uh, Terry asks, the jurors who were not dismissed today in the Daybell case, are they automatically selected? Or will the state and defense get a list of more than the 18 they need and then select the final jury from the full list of prospective jurors? Good question, Terry. Let me explain again. There's new people tuning in. What they are doing, they're bringing in these groups of 16. They're whittling down those groups, those that advance 
are building a new pool to get to 50. Once it gets to 50, all of them will come back and it will strike down and move down to 18. So they're not automatically on the jury yet, but they're getting there. I did pull this up from Lori's case. Um, last year on day one of jury selection, Lori's case, we had three groups of 15 brought in. So we had seen 45 by this point last year. Today, we've only seen 32. Last year, by this point, 45 were questioned, 17 remained in the pool. So we're actually um, further ahead this year than, well, no, 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 we're behind by one. So um, it will be 16 last year, 17. So we're kind of on par last year, even though less jurors have been questioned today and it's a death penalty case, we're kind of on par for last year. That could change in the coming days. Donna, did jurors get asked if they've read any of Chad's books? They they were probably asked that on the questionnaire. The questionnaire is sealed. I haven't seen it. Um, I'd love to see it. If one of you got one and want to send it to me anonymously, I'd be happy to look it over. Um, but they did not bring that up today. None of them were asked about that today. If the, Is the death penalty on the table for Chad? If so, can he still take a plea deal? Yes, there are. Uh, it is on the table and he can take a plea deal. If the prosecutor will offer him one, that's acceptable. I would imagine if the if Chad said, okay, I'll plead to all of them, give me life, they're gonna say yes. Or I'll plead to all of them, take off the insurance fraud or whatever, and I'll get life, they're gonna say yes. So we could go through all this jury selection and next week there could be a plea. Or we could go all the way to the end and there's no plea. Other than the plea the, the jury had. The audio is terrible today. Can you pass this on to the courts? We passed on to the court. I want to tell you part of the reason is John Pryor did not turn on his microphone. It had to be repeatedly reminded to turn on his microphone. And if you know John Pryor, tell him to turn on the mic. And also he would talk away from the mic like this. I won't do it because I know it's a pain. Also, the jurors each had little microphones in front of them and there was a roving mic and they just weren't used to talking into it. I think once the trial gets going, let's hope they're talking into those mics. The, the, the recorder repeatedly said to John Pryor, just talk into your mic. You, you got to talk into your mic. So I hear you. It was bad. It wasn't on our end. I'm sorry. It was on theirs. Why does Pryor keep going out of the scope when asking juror questions when he knows he isn't supposed to? Can that not taint potential jurors? Uh, well, potential jurors that have summons that are there shouldn't, they're not supposed to be watching. So, um, if, if they're not supposed to, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to answer your other question. It was, it, there were a couple of objections raised here and there, but, um, that wasn't really, you know, it was resolved there in the courtroom. Why is Judge Boyce, this is from Doreen, not allowing the jury to know about Lori's trial? It's a separate it's a separate thing. Now, they did mention that there, there are co-conspirators, but it's a whole separate trial. And, and a lot of the jurors knew about Lori's trial, but because they have to judge Chad based on Chad's actions alone, not based on what Lori was convicted of. If they find out that Lori was guilty and they were co-conspirators, it could automatically taint the jurors. So they just have to focus on what he is accused of doing, not um, not Lori and not Alex. Why 50 jurors? Candace asks. I don't know. That's the number the judge came up with, I guess. Uh, maybe it's in state code. I honestly don't know the answer to that because for Lori's it was 42. So there was eight more. Constance, was anyone helping Pryor take notes to keep track of jurors? So Pryor and the defense attorneys, they all had computers on their the uh, or the prosecutors and prior all had computers on their tables and then they had the, the questionnaires and then they pulled them up. So they were able to look at the questionnaires. They had, I saw one of them, they had like the photo of the juror. They had all sorts of stuff. It, it appears they may have done background checks on some of them. Prior did have a private investigator, I guess you could call it, somebody there with him, not at the table, but seated behind him, which is normal. Lori Vallow had her private investigator there at that case. And, um, he was taking a few notes, but no, it is just him. You have to think, this is kind of surreal to think about. Lori Vallow had two attorneys, both death penalty certified, who have done multiple criminal cases assisting her. John Pryor has not done one death penalty case and has done a couple of criminal cases, and he's the only attorney for Chad Daybell. It's kind of mind-blowing to, to see that, but that it is what it is. 
Did Chad stay motionless and stiff all day? Jonathan asks. Uh, kind of, for the most part. I did see him smile and laugh a, a couple of times and chat, but he was, he was, you know, just, just himself. And I think that's probably how he is outside of a courtroom too. This is just who he is. I couldn't see Larry and Kay. Were they there? They were not here today. They will be here later this week. They had a family obligation. Sharon, any of the Daybell kids show up or Colby? Nope. None of them were there today. Um, maybe later this week. Vicki Hoban was there, Tammy Daybell's aunt. She came in and she said she plans to be there the entire time. Mary asks, can Pryor be looking for a mistrial? The way he's questioning the jurors was concerning to me, overly aggressive and making assumptions on the circumstances. Um, well, I mean, I guess he could, but if it's a mistrial, he'd have to do it. Um, if for some reason he couldn't represent Chad Daybell, we'd have to be here again in another year or two. Now, there might be appellate issues when it comes down to it, but, uh, you know, I just, I think that's just his style and um, just how he is. Can Debbie, Debbie says, can Debbie still get the death penalty in Arizona? I think that means Lori. Can Lori still get the death penalty in Arizona? Unless there's a Debbie on death row, Lori cannot. It is not a first degree murder case in Arizona, so can't can't be death penalty down there. All right. I think we got through it all, man. Thank you all for watching. I, I, uh, all my computer screens went blank here. So I hope we're still transmitting and that you're watching again. I will be back tomorrow in the courtroom and, um, you can follow me once again here on these platforms. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and let me know uh, your thoughts. We'll be back again tomorrow night and we'll break it down day two. We'll have Keith Morrison here. It will be a really great program. Um, I, I, personally can't thank you enough for tuning into this we're a local newsroom that you know we we do local news there's a staff of 13 14 of us and so um it it when one of us is out it can kind of hurt not hurt the newsroom but you know we all like to be together so this is the, for for me to be able to come to boise and report to you and that you actually watch it and care about it i appreciate that and um thank you for watching and subscribing on youtube and for all of the other uh, channels that you're watching on, um, I, I just really appreciate it. I'm going to go find some dinner. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm hungry. And it's 730 almost. And um, well, have a good day, everybody. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.